Ryan White, uh, you directed the short documentary Coded, which tells the story of gay illustrator J.C. Leyendecker, who uh, was able to communicate queerness in his illustrations and advertisements, uh, even though he was working in the early 20th century. Uh, when did you become familiar with Leyendecker and his work? Uh, when I started making this film. So I, I mean, I think that's sort of the point of the film is that so few people have heard of J.C. Leyendecker and I and I sort of shamefully am one of those people who had never heard of him. Um, so I had made a documentary series in 2020 for Apple TV Plus called Visible, which is, which is about the history of LGBTQ representation on television. So it's all about um, television history. So the first episode took place in the 40s and 50s with the advent of television and our first storyline in that series was about the army mccarthy hearings which was the first time the word homosexual was ever said on television and at the time that went out to you know tens of millions of people because there were so few channels and, and and lgbtq people were were obviously demonized in the army mccarthy hearings but in the research of that storyline we discovered uh this era that predated that that predated the great depression during the Roaring Twenties that many people refer to, many historians refer to as the pansy craze, uh, which was this era of a, a pretty large burst of LGBTQ progress that even I as a gay person didn't know a lot about. I saw, uh, I think a season of Transparent where they went into that in Berlin a little bit, uh, but that it was happening in a lot of the, the major metropolises worldwide, including New York. And uh, that's where we discovered J.C. Leyendecker, who was a prominent New Yorker, one of the most famous Americans in the 1920s, rumored to be the, the uh, impetus for the great Gatsby. Um, and it kind of blew my mind that this man had been so famous um, and that had be, he had been creating artwork and ads that were all over American magazines and newspapers that were so seemingly gay and homoerotic uh, in the 1920s. And we wanted to know more about him and why his story has been somewhat forgotten from, from history. Uh, and, you know, how is it different, uh, you know, really digging into this one subject versus, uh, as you mentioned, Visible, which was such a this broad uh, survey of, of, of history? Yeah, well, Visible was sort of an outlier uh, in my filmmaking career. I mostly have made uh, verite films, you know, following something, some sort of event unfolding. And almost all my films besides Visible have been about a character, a group of characters. Like that's why I love documentary filmmaking. I love holding my camera and just following the unpredictability of something. So I was much more comfortable kind of going back to my roots with the story of Leyendecker because it was a character film. And even though the story was a hundred years old, it it felt like the verite process in a lot of ways because it was a, a process of discovery um, through archival and unearthing his letters and diaries and whatever whatever existed. So in that way, um, even though it could be looked at as sort of ancient history, it felt it felt very alive in a way of getting to, going through that discovery and investigation process to find out his his life story. Uh, and, you know, in, in the process of telling this film, uh, you know, you incorporate animation uh, into the film, uh, which, you know, of course, is fitting with uh, Line Decker and his work uh, and his style. Uh, how did how did that idea develop and, and, and how did you uh, want to work to incorporate that? Well, I think the animation uh, is spawned for, for, from a couple different places. First, uh, the visual record was so limited of Lion Decker's life. And uh, if you watch the film, that was deliberately so. When Lion Decker died, he had his lifelong partner burn most of the visual record from his life, most of his uh, letters and diaries, and even a lot of his artwork, unfortunately. Um, and so there weren't a ton of photos, there was no footage of Lion Decker, so we had to figure out a way to constitute uh, the film, and I think it's part of the reason it made a better short film than a feature film was because the, the visual record was so limited. Um, and the second reason for animation was, you know, we did, we did this film during COVID. Uh, we began the film um, in, the, in the summer of 2020. Um, and all the Verite films that I've been making were shut down, understandably, because we couldn't be out in the field. And so to tell the Lion Decker story, 
uh, presented, at least for me as a filmmaker, a unique opportunity to, to flex a different muscle and to use a, a new skill set. And animation is very easy to do during a pandemic because it's all done within these ama amazing artist offices. Uh, and this team of people sort of brought, uh, brought Lion Decker's artwork to life and Lion Decker's personal story we animate sort of inspired by the brush strokes of, of his very signature brush strokes of his artwork. So um, it was safe um, and it allowed us, uh, it allowed us a way to tell a story from a hundred years ago. Uh, and, you know, helping to bring uh, the story to life also was uh, Neil Patrick Harris, who uh, is featured in the film uh, as the voice of, of Lion Decker. Uh, he also participated in, in Visual, Invisible. Um, like, what, what was that decision like to bring him on board and, and to have him uh, bring Lion Decker's words to life? Yeah, he's like my go-to voiceover actor now. No, bo both times we've asked Neil to be on projects. I've been shocked when he said yes, honestly, more more uh, coded than visible because it's a short film. I mean, as, as everyone I'm sure will talk about today, it's it's really it's really difficult when you've made a short to grab to grab the attention um, that you can with a feature or a series. And so I wasn't sure, you know, Neil was our top choice. I think he was sort of the perfect person to play Lion Decker. So he was the first person we went out with, but I was, um, expecting to get a no or even more likely to get no response at all. Uh, so when he responded so posit positively to it, I was thrilled because I think it, I think it gets the film a little bit more um, visibility than, than it would have without um, someone of his stature. And he also brought, um, you know, Neil's a brilliant actor and I realized this invisible even though he was doing narration work invisible. Um, there's a real genius um, when it comes to voiceover acting, and especially, um, you know, I would consider coded more acting than the narration. You know, he's playing Lion Decker, and so he brought an emotional depth to Lion Decker that uh, that far exceeded my expectations. So we were we were thrilled when he said yes, and when uh, when we recorded it with him, it just uh, it just made the film even better. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, in, in the film, uh, Lion Decker had much of his materials destroyed after his death, and it, it sort of makes me reflect on how much homophobia has, you know, cost us in, in just history, uh, like right. all of these documents that we probably, that we don't have, that we maybe would have if there had been more openness uh, throughout history. Uh, you know, what do you think about that sort of like excavating of like things that we continue to learn about historical figures and, uh, you know, gay history was much more prominent than, you know, we usually think of it. Yeah, I think, I think we often think that gay history began with Stonewall and we, we ran into this invisible as well and understanding that it far, uh, you know, as important as Stonewall was and it is, it is a, a huge turning point for us as a community, but there was a lot of history before that. And like you said, unfortunately, a lot of that has been lost, whether that was deliberately or not, um, or will never be known. You know, one of my one of my favorite parts of having made coded is hearing from people about the older generations in their family. And you know, even Lion Deck, even though Lion Decker is probably one of the most famous queer people from his era, even his story was lost. So you can imagine non-famous people. So we've been hearing from a lot of, especially people of older generations who their older generations might have been gay and hit it for whatever reason, you know? So you'll hear stories like, oh, you know, my, my aunt was like that. She had a lifelong roommate and no one, you know, in the 1910s through the 1950s and no one, no one ever talked about it. But now when I look back, that was her, that was her wife. Uh, and so I think that's I think that's a really um, fun part of getting to be a documentary filmmaker from a marginalized community. Is I know that's been my education in queer history a lot is watching documentaries um, because it wasn't taught to me in school growing up. And so getting to tell those stories, you know, it's not I don't exclusively make queer stories, but a lot of my filmography has been feels like, you know, getting to add to that history where we, you know, we as a community get to tell our own stories and our community gets to watch these stories that may have been forgotten for whatever reason.